Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And on the occasion of Austria's National Day on October 26, also known as Austria's Day of Neutrality, I'm joined by two wonderful Austrian academics. Michael Gehler is Professor for History and the head of the Institute for History at the University of Hildesheim. He has published well more than 300 individual commentaries, articles and books, one of them being the 2007 German language work Model Case for Germany, the Austrian solution of a state treaty with neutrality, 1945 to 55, in which he analyzes on 1,400 pages Germany's lost chance to reunite in the 50s by way of a neutral solution, the very same way that Austria regained its independence and retained unity through its neutrality. Secondly, I'm also joined by my colleague and friend Heinz Gärtner, an emeritus professor at the University of Vienna, a pro-peace and pro-neutrality activist who has also written great many, many books, great amounts of them. And he's a frequent guest on this show, so I know you know him from before. Michael and Heinz, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, thank you, Pascal. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, well, to both of you, we want to discuss today neutrality in Europe and the lessons from the Cold War of that. Um, Michael, you researched various neutral states and initiatives for neutral solutions in Europe. Most importantly, of course, the difference between Austria and Germany, which both had a Soviet offer for, for a neutral solution on the table back in 53, 54, 55. Um, one took the offer. Austria and became neutral and and remained united, and the other one didn't divided and went through uh you know the Cold War as we know it. Um, what does that episode teach us about neutrality during the Cold War? Yes, uh, let me first say that the title of this uh, mentioned book, uh, Model Case for Germany, uh, there was a question mark behind that title. That would say that. Both cases were different, but they could have been treated in similar ways. Uh, this is one of the outcomes of that book. To give an answer to your question, I think neutrality was a means for Austria to preserve its territorial integrity, to also secure uh, its borders, and what, what was most, most more important, to gain state independence, sovereignty, and to get the Russian troops out. The Federal Republic of Germany rejected neutrality. And um, also the pledge made in coordination with the Western powers to the Soviet Union as Austria had done it. So the accepted consequence of this decision to reject neutrality was the division of Germany. So for Austria, there was unity, national unity, um, let's say, with freedom through state treaty and a self-declared self -declared permanent neutrality. And the country, what is also important, was and remained more or less Western-oriented. Concerning the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, the rejection of neutrality ultimately meant only partial freedom from, from the Western side, West Germany, without the whole German unification, without, let's say, sovereignty and independence. And while the GDR, East Germany, remained completely outside and the East Germans were left behind the Iron Curtain, so the German division, Germany's division, I think, was the price for the German rejection of neutrality. To make a long story short, uh, Heinz, how do you how do you view this episode? Um, uh, two points. Uh, one, uh, before uh, uh, Austria adopted uh, the neutrality in uh, fifty five, so it was not necessarily that it was, was at that time uh, a Soviet uh, offer because the Soviets stopped to uh, ask for neutrality in uh, late fifty. A four because they said until the German militarism is not solved, there cannot be neutrality. And there have, have been two factions in Moscow, the Molotov, Suslov, and the Karanovich section at the Khrushchev Malenko sec section. And um, Molotov was against it. And the Austrian Chancellor Raab negotiated with the Khrushchev 
uh, faction. And then they negotiated, the Soviets accepted uh, Austria's uh, bid for Austria's proposal for neutrality. So it was more an Austrian request than an, uh, a Soviet uh, offer. Uh, then uh, after 55, and the German question, of course, I have to, um, you know, there has been several attempts, so let alone the Stalin note of 55, several attempts by Western pundits and experts and diplomats to look at Austria and suggest that there should be a neutral Central Europe, uh, including Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, because uh, 10 years after the Second World War, uh, Austria got its uh, sovereignty and um, uh, territorial integrity with neutrality back, and Germany still was divided. So no German uh, unification inside. So there have been suggestions by George Cannon, for example, or by a bipartisan uh, initiative in, from the, in the American Senate, Nolan Humphrey, also the leader of the British Labour Party, Hugh Geitzkeld, they all uh, suggested the same uh, similar uh, uh, had similar ideas like as a neutral uh, Central Europe, a unification of Germany. On top of that, uh, um, there was in 57 uh, the Rapatsky plan who asked for disengagement zones, which basically means a neutral zone with a nuclear weapon free uh, zone as well. Uh, also, Austria was a model because in Austrian state treaty, Austria was prohibited to uh, get nuclear weapons. So Austria was already a nuclear weapon-free state. So uh, it didn't work out because of the uh, uh, Cold War. And uh, actually, I have to say, uh, US President Eisenhower supported Austria's uh, uh, neutrality. Uh, of course, there was a division between the, his foreign minister, John Foster Dallas, who was more on the Adenauer side, uh, who rejected uh, uh, neutrality, but Eisenhower sub, uh, supported it. And let me just finish with one anecdote. In '56, when there was a Hungarian uprising, and the Soviets suspected Austria to host uh, uh, Hungarian insurgents and threatened Austria, and Eisenhower would say that from Foreign Ministry at that time uh, uh, would say, if Austria's neutrality is violated, uh, that would lead to a third world war. Strong words, but it means that neutrality, if respected, can be a very good security guarantee. You know, this is really interesting because one of the reasons why the Germans uh, declined this idea of neutrality, which for the Germans actually came from the from the Russians. I mean, even Stalin, uh, when he was still alive, kind of offered this, right? And there were, there were cartoons about, oh, no, this is just a ploy. Michael, um, there is this, there, there is, there are historians, uh, Austrian historians, most importantly, our colleague Peter Ruckenthaler, who strongly claim that, look, this was never meant serious, like neutrality for Germany never was meant seriously by the Soviets. And the arguments that that he brings out is that we there are no, uh, there's no archival record in Moscow that would prove that the Soviets seriously prepared for an Austrian, if, sorry, for a German uh, reunification and neutralization. So it was always just a ploy or a or a or a political talking point. Um, but you see it differently, don't you? Yes, uh, I, I see it very differently because we have first of all to differentiate between the different notes uh, which were published um, by um, the Soviets. So the first was on the tenth of March fifty two. The second one was then. Um, on the 9th of April, and then the following two notes were not really so much substantial than the first ones. And the notes, um, sorry, just all, to, to interject, the notes are the offers from, from the Soviets who wrote, yes. like, how about you become neutral? Mm -hmm. We have to look um, very carefully to the content of both of these notes. 10th uh, of March, 52, and the second one, the 9th of April, 52. And if you look to the content, what was what was the main goal? The main goal was the conclusion of a German peace treaty. And this was in, in the core interest by the Soviet Union. And they, they offered in this note, the Soviets offered in this note, not only to negotiate on a German peace treaty on a four power level, they also said, 
it should be possible that the, the future uh, united unified germany should be not part of any coalition neutralization was never mentioned in these texts and also not neutrality but um koalitionsfreiheit in german so free of alliances that's a very important point and um secondly or thirdly they also offered a, a, a German national army. So it was clear that Germany should be then in the in a position to defend her position, future unified Germany, as a, uh, let's say, non-aligned, alliance-free country. In the second offer, Stalin also proposed free elections for whole Germany. And you can say, well, all this stuff was propaganda, but I think it's too simple. It's it's too simple. The, the main important point is that Adenauer and also the Western powers feared that this uh, these offers are um, so uh, serious, but also so dangerous for their concept to to integrate Western Germany into the Western system that they uh, feared that. Really, the Soviets meant this; these offers very, very serious, and that's why they 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 feared that they would lose their positions in West Germany. And uh, uh, um, concerning Peter Rubenthaler's book, I cannot see any real proof related to Stalin that this was only a bluff. Um, and if you look to Soviet interests, they 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 always came back to the Potsdam Agreement in the late 40s and the very beginnings and till the midst of the 50s. And also later on, they referred to Potsdam for power solution for Germany, getting also access to the German economic potential concerning the Ruhr territory. So it was in the interest of the Soviet Union and the leadership to prevent a strong anti-communist, anti-Soviet bulwark um, through West Germany. And uh, I think the better solution was a, a unified, alliance-free uh, Germany. If you look to an internal report by the Secret Service of the State Department from July 55, you can find out a very interesting thing, because Heinz um, mentioned before an anecdote. This is more than an anecdote. It's very interesting what the, the internal assessment uh, brought out on the question of a neutralized, neutral Germany. I can quote that. It's, it's after the FRG uh, followed a joint NATO. Uh, I, I can quote, a neutralization or neutrality of Germany was neither ruled out nor considered impossible by the Secret Service of the State Department. And according to this internal assessment, no communist, no pro-Soviet Germany was expected in case of alliance-free or neutral uh, Germany. On the contrary, even if the Soviet Union had lured with German eastern territories beyond the oder neisse line, Germany would not have crossed over into the Soviet orbit, but would have resisted it and secretly co cooperated with NATO and remained pro-Western. So much just for an internal assessment that was not intended for the for the German public. So the examples of Austria and also Finland prove this assumption. They were they were and remained Western oriented, and and um, and they did not become communist. So from a rational case analysis, I think the first and the second offer, fifty two Stalin notes were meant seriously. But there were many options. I think it was a case, a test, and, and, a, and a document for all options. If the West would reject that, then Stalin, then the Soviet Union could also argue, well, that, that's your problem. You were not ready to, to negotiate. But the main topic was and the main goal was to get a German peace treaty. And a Koalitionsfreiheit was one of the means, national army was one of the means uh, to get a German peace treaty. That was in main interest of Germany. And I think this point is neglected by Peter Ruckenthaler.
I think so too. So, and Heinz, I suppose you you agree with this that there, there was a real chance there, wasn't it? Wasn't it when the when the Soviets offered it again and again? Uh, I think Adenauer uh, opposed it from the beginning. So he uh, put uh, Western integration before any uh, unification and or even uh, uh, neutrality. So I did not see any chance that uh, Adenauer would have accepted a neutrality, let alone what the Soviets and what uh, Stalin uh, were, were, were thinking. Um, and also the Austria's uh, situation was, I think Austria could not have become neutral as long as Stalin uh, was was alive. But still, Austria's neutrality was very much linked to the German, German question, also from the Soviet uh, perspective. And it, it's not accident that Austria could only officially uh, get the state treaty and uh, adopt the neutrality after the decision has been made that Germany would uh, join NATO, Germany, uh, without uh, Austria. So it was already uh, the Paris uh, agreements in uh, uh, late 54 when the decision was uh, made and Germany was NATO member, uh, became NATO member and Austria then uh, was, uh, the Austrian situation was delinked from uh, Germany. But Adenauer always said uh, neutrality is a Soviet poison. It's a Soviet poison and of course he was wrong. You're looking at uh, um, uh, Austria and looking at Finland as uh, Michael uh, mentioned, uh, he, he was wrong. So neither Austria nor uh, Finland uh, became a part of the communist uh, uh, system, um, and uh, but there was a, a danger for Austria to be to remain divided. So there is no doubt about this because uh, in forty uh, six, when Churchill uh, gave his speak, uh, speech in Fulton, he said. Uh, the future Europe, uh, the, the map of future Europe would look like Berlin and uh, Vienna would be part of the Eastern Bloc. So uh, that means Vienna and Berlin, Eastern Bloc and Germany and Austria divided. That was uh, the idea uh, behind it. And the final point, uh, Austria was also a, a model because Michael mentioned uh, Finland uh, for Finland because Finland had this uh, friendship treaty with the Soviet Union in 1948, and there was a real possibility dif different to Austria uh, that Finland uh, would be integrated in the Warsaw Pact Treaty because the Soviet Union had other friendship treaties uh, with Romania, uh, Bulgaria, and, and so and Finland um, always said we don't want to keep out of the great power competition, uh, but not until Austria became neutral, Finland uh, dared to use the word neutrality. And ever since, the Finns would say neutral, neutral, uh, and uh, meant get more independent independence from the Soviet Union. And the Soviets always said friendship trip, more consultation, and the Finns would say neutrality. And the uh, Soviets got annoyed. And after uh, 1968, after the Soviet invasion in Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union deleted the word neutrality from all uh, bilateral treaties uh, between uh, the Soviet Union and Finland, what changed after uh, Gorbachev. Uh, so Finland's uh, neutrality was successful not to get integrated into the Russia Pact. Op the opposite what Adenauer suspected, and the same is true uh, for Austria. Neutrality is always- like to, I, I would like to underline the position pointed out by Heinz. I think Adenauer was the key figure when rejecting this offer. And it's interesting to see that uh, a few days after the first offer came out by Stalin, Paul Nitze from the State Department, from the German desk said, we should be prepared in case if Adenauer is willing to negotiate. And the Americans prepared just a date uh, in 52 for um, all German free elections. And uh, uh, McLoy talked to Adenauer and said, uh, uh, what what uh, shall we do? And Adenauer said, we should continue with our policy of Western integration. If you look to the memoirs written by Adenauer, the other way around was uh, said by him. He had asked McLoy, what, should, what, what shall we do? And McLoy should have said, uh, we will continue with our policy. It was the, the, the opposite. 
Adenauer took the decision. And very interesting, in April, Dean Acheson, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, said, well, now we know the, 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 the position of Adenauer. We should now try to negotiate with Stalin just for having a showdown and just to see that he is bluffing. And then Adenauer was always a very um, furious and said, no, 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 no debate, no negotiations, because in the end, Adenauer meant this really serious. So very interesting. Adenauer was the key decision, the, the key decision maker, sorry. And I think that's one of the, the main points of that discussion. Let me, let me, let me add a, a little story about that. Um, Adenauer was such a staunch uh, defender uh, of Western integration and yes. uh, sent a message to the Americans. Uh, and the Americans still talked until 56, 57 uh, about unification. But there was a secret document to the National Security uh, Council in uh, the US in 58. And they said, uh, all right, Germany does not really want unification. So we have to stop to go forward with this idea. We talk on a general level of, about unification, but not on a policy level. And that, that's the quote, in order to keep the Germans happy. So they, they put off unification for a uh, very, very long time because they knew Adenauer would not want it anyway. Okay, and I will skip now one one of the questions that I sent you previously. Let me go straight into the, my third point that I want to discuss with both of you, which is that the, the historical example of the neutrality discussion about Germany shows to me that, well, polit politics and political moments are very contingent upon like different different factors and like different stars aligning. So in a sense for Austria, the stars align to become neutral and stay unified. And for Germany, it didn't mainly because the the, the little star uh, uh, Adenauer didn't want to didn't want to play ball with with that possibility. Didn't go down that route. Do you too see parallels between that history of of Germany and 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 Europe, how it developed, and today? I mean, to me, the parallels with with Ukraine are actually quite quite strong, but maybe I'm over-interpreting this. Um, Michael, do you see parallels between the Cold War and what happened to Germany and today? Yes, I, I think um, um, historical comparisons are always uh, useful and uh, leading to further knowledge, but also the differences uh, had to be taken into account. I think it's a comparable uh, constellation with differences. In the East-West confrontation, we had the non-aligned and neutral states. Uh, actually, in the multipolar constellation, we have new non-aligned and neutral uh, states. If you look to, to the attitude by Brazil, by India and South Africa um, uh, towards the issue of the Russian war against the Ukraine. So uh, it's interesting that they, that they are not really condemning Putin's war of aggression. Sometimes they also blame Zelensky, uh, that he has also a kind of responsibility for this war. So um, I think in this big confrontation between the European Union and the United States, on the one hand, against the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation, if you take Brazil, if you take India and you you take also South Africa, they are undecided. They take a kind of non-aligned neutral position. And what Brazil and India are doing, I think Switzerland and Austria can also do this if they want it. So I think neutrals also of today don't need to add further fuel to the confrontation, which has already largely escalated actually because we are on the brink of a war with nuclear weapons. I think the situation of today is much more difficult, complex and dangerous than the Cold War, the old Cold War we had from uh, 45, 47 to, to 89, 91. And this is being waged at the expense of Europe. And the question is, what is the position of Europe? 
What is the position of Germany? Do we have a strategy uh, beyond the American strategy, which obviously tries to weaken Russia or to make Russia not more aggressive than in the case of, of Ukraine? So what is the, the European position? And I think the neutrals are the remaining neutrals, we have to say, because Finland joined NATO and Sweden will do that, I think, very soon. Depends also, uh, only on, on the uh, Hungarian green light of the Hungarian parliament, because Turkey and Erdogan just uh, gave the green light. So what did Switzerland and Austria? Three things. Reducing the energy supply from Russia. Second, also participating in the sanctions against Putin's systems and structures and third providing humanitarian aid and all these things these three issues um, are a clever a good mixture uh, com let's say compatible with neutrality and uh, supplying weapons i think is out of the question so this mixture seems reasonable and seems a, a, a rational and, and good choice not to escalate, but to also not be out of the scenario. So I think that's compatible with neutrality and uh, Switzerland and Austria uh, act here, I think, in a very reasonable, also sensible way. And maybe Heinz, um, do you see parallels? I mean, the parallel that I meant also was how the, how in my view, Ukrainian neutrality was torpedoed mainly by Western powers, not by not by the Russian, uh, not by Russia, which actually demanded it, which actually wanted Ukrainian neutrality. Do you do you see parallels with 1955 Germany? I saw parallels uh, uh, already. I published a piece in an Austrian uh, paper in uh, March three, um, uh, where I said in order to avoid uh, war. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine should look at the Austrian uh, model uh, of neutrality. Um, that, that, that March 3 was all, uh, before the uh, inv so, uh, Russian invasion in, in Crimea. So my consequence at that time already, March 3, was uh, e either we will have a war uh, or we will have a divided uh, Ukraine like Germany. So now it turns out it's like more uh, divided Ukraine like Korea, but my prediction was division, uh, permanent division or permanent neutrality. That was uh, my suggestion for, for Ukraine. It didn't work out. We cannot discuss it uh, uh, at length here. Of course, in, in March uh, uh, 22, there was still on the table in Istanbul neutrality. For several reasons, it was abandoned. Uh, second was uh, what Michael uh, said. Uh, of course, neutrality in always comes in different shapes and uh, forms in history. And now the global South is emerging and has more or less non-aligned uh, neutral uh, positions. And uh, quantitatively in Europe, it's true, we have less neutrals, but that doesn't mean that neutrality lose, would lose uh, quality. I would say the opposite is true now. The remaining neutrals have additional tasks and uh, Austria, together, of course, with Ireland and uh, Malta and Cyprus, but they have the important task to build a bridge uh, between the European Union and the Global South. Because Austria, for example, has the same, and the other states as well, the same position, uh, the same uh, uh, the same uh, philosophy like most of the countries in the Global South uh, East. They are non-aligned. And they are nuclear weapon free. And uh, in terms of nuclear weapon uh, uh, free zones, uh, Austria is a tradition. It also played, Austria played an important role to set up the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So they have, Austria would have comparative advantages uh, here. So, and I just want to uh, another mention another analogy during the Cold War when the non-aligned, neutral and non-aligned were very active in setting up the conference on security and cooperation in Europe, the CSE uh, process without the non neutral and non-aligned that wouldn't have happened. Uh, Yugoslavia played this role. 
And Yugoslavia played a very active role in the CAC process, but also a leading role in the non-aligned movement in the third uh, world at that, at that time. So Austria would have a responsibility to uh, pick up this, uh, to seize this uh, opportunity. But after the end of the, some years after the end of the war in Ukraine, we will have to have another uh, CAC process that would be necessary uh, that neutral and non-aligned also from the global south would start such a debate. But of course, uh, the, the the summit will not help be Helsinki anymore uh, because uh, Helsinki will be part of NATO, but maybe Vienna or some uh, capital in, from the global south. Right. Let me, let, let me add one thing, and I, I fully agree with Heinz, with his uh, interpretation, also with his hope towards Switzerland and Austria as maybe hopefully future mediators also. Um, the difference to Germany in the 50s and now, I think if we can refer to that famous quotation by Lord Ismay, what is the purpose of NATO? He said internally, to keep the Russians out, to keep us, the West, the Americans in, and to keep the Germans down. The big difference is um, Germany now should not be... Um, to be kept down. No, they actually need a stronger Germany, much more involved in that Ukrainian war, more indirectly than directly. But the, see, the, the, the first two goals still are valid. So to keep the Russians out and to keep us, the Americans, the Brits, the West in. And in the consequence, in the end, this would mean a German solution for Ukraine. The division of Ukraine and let's say a kind of of, of a new Iron Curtain, uh, much more going to, to east, not from Stettin to Trieste, but from Finland up to the Black Sea. And this would be, I think, for Europe, from a point of view of European policy of responsibility, a, a very bad solution, a worst case solution. And I will come back also to George F. Kennan, a wise man, uh, Heinz mentioned him before, he said very early when the first NATO enlargement started in 1999 with Poland, with uh, Hungary and the Czech Republic, this NATO Eastern enlargement would be the continuation of a new Cold War. And what we have now is a new Cold War, I think, since the late 1990s, plus a hot regional war in the center of Europe. And this cannot be in the interest from the from a European point of view, from a EU point of view. And that's why I think there's a strong need for also neutrals in, in Europe, the rest of the neutrals, the hope for that. Uh, in um, The other way would, would mean that Chinese, Americans, Russians, or Turkey would, would negotiate, would mediate. And this also cannot be in the interest of a, let's say, a policy of European responsibility for Europe. So there's a big danger that the European Union will lose its position of a regional power in Europe itself. So it's a worst case scenario. And my hope is also that neutrals will remain and will be engaged. But this, was, this would mean in the case of Austria to reactivate her neutrality, that's the precondition uh, in order then to engage or to have an engaged neutrality. Which is a concept that you have been championing for a long time, Heinz, isn't it? Yeah, yes, that's true. <clears throat> we have to, uh, neutrality is coming uh, with very different shapes, as I said. So over history, neutrality has taken uh, different forms and has been very flexible. And of course, in the 19th century, we had only a neutrality, the occasional neutrality, keep staying out of uh, uh, war. But then there was also for a time the um, uh, Pascal, you know this better than I do, I do this isolationist uh, integral neutrality. Uh, but then we moved on, Austria had, uh, had the concept of active neutrality in the 70s, but we are not in the 70s uh, anymore. And now uh, engaged neutrality means that we are Austria is part of the 
uh, European security defense um, uh, policy and also part of the partnership for peace. But also neutrality is not a neutrality when it comes to values. Uh, or not neutral should raise the voice that if it comes to massive human rights violations, to genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, cleansing uh, and, and war. Uh, but uh, at the same time, engaged neutrality means that uh, neutral states have to offer something. They have to mm. make proposals to set initiatives. Otherwise, it would be on, on what, what this would uh, only be confessions like, uh, against uh, uh, human rights violations. So we have to suggest something. And uh, now we are back basically. As uh, Michael said, we are in a situation like in the 50s with the Cold War and the new Iron Curtain, the Cold and Sanitaire. So we have to move on to the 70s, uh, to the uh, CSE process. And then neutral and non-aligned states, I include the Global South, have to start initiatives. The Helsinki or the CSE process began uh, at, at 71, so a couple of years uh, before the Helsinki summit took place. So now neutral and non-aligned states together with uh, um, uh, states from the global south would have to start uh, a new process in order to avoid that we go through to the, all, the whole situation in the 50s and in the 60s coming to the 70s. We were lucky if we could do this, uh, but... Uh, the Americans would say America is an indispensable nation, Madeleine Allwright. I would say the neutral uh, in this is indispensable states. My 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 problem that I have is that I see that the the neutrals of Europe, Austria, Switzerland included, Ireland too, are so incredibly weak when it comes to to uh, dissociate themselves from what's currently being pushed in the west that they are they're fully completely integrated i mean the the western neutrals switzerland austria were very quick to to follow the condemnation of russia after uh in february 2022 immediately immediately and said this is this is against international law and everything and right now right now as we speak I hear no condemnation of the ongoing genocide right now in uh, in Gaza. I mean, five thousand people are dead already, and there seems there's nothing. I mean, the West kind of made its narrative, and our our countries are always on board with what's currently coming from Washington. At least that's what it seems to me. And I know that 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 colleagues from the global south also see it like that. Um, I know this is a very, very contro um, controversial and contemporary thing. But uh, Michael, do you do you think that the the European neutrals still have some power in themselves not to go along with every new uh, new narrative that comes from uh, from Berlin, Brussels, and Washington. Well, I think they have uh, no real um, strong power. But if you take the other uh, EU and NATO member states, and if you look to the um, attempts to get a solution. Uh, within the Minsk I and Minsk II negotiations, uh, the so-called Normandy format, when Germany, France, Belarus, um, uh, Russia, and Ukraine negotiated that. Uh, in the end, it failed because I think there was also no strong hard power uh, by the Germans at that time to put more pressure on the Ukraine and on, on Russia. Um, also France, you know, it's an atomic power, but, ha but had not such a strong hard power on a conventionally military base. So in the end, this, this failed. And because it was also not in the American interest that the, that the, the, the Europeans um, under themselves would neg negotiate this issue with uh, Ukraine and Russia. So the problem of a lacking of hard power is not only a problem of Austria and Switzerland, but they have uh, soft power. And they have one thing what is important, both Austria and Switzerland, not Ireland, are states with seats of international organizations. So United Nations, the OSCE, um, the, the, the OPEC, 
uh, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and these uh, international organizations bring countries, states together, which are also opponents and rivals. This is one thing I think which which is very important to keep this position as mediators with international seats. So neutrality is not only useful for Switzerland and Austria itself, but also useful for uh, the world of states. And I think this is still important. And if you take the Cold War, the new Cold War, which I argue since 1999, uh, with, with a hot regional uh, war in Europe, much more dangerous than the old Cold War. I think this old Cold War was more controlled, more, more risk limited between the USSR and, and the U US. The new Cold War has much more incalculable and unpredictable concerning the outcome. That's why the neutrals, I think, are a better um, way to, to negotiate via Geneva, via Vienna, then in the end, uh, Beijing and Moscow and Washington will negotiate uh, the the Ukrainian, the ending of the Ukrainian war uh, uh, without the Europeans, without the neutrals. But there's a still an important point, what Heinz said, Helsinki 2.0 will not happen. And also Stockholm will not be the place when when Sweden will, will join NATO. So the neutrals have room of maneuver. They have to be more initiative. They have to be more active, more engaged. And uh, let's, let's uh, add a further point. Uh, also, we have um, this NATO Partnership for Peace, PFP. Um, concerning Austria and concerning Switzerland, I think this PFP construct is a uh, useful, practical and also a pragmatic way to be to a certain way in and not uh, totally on the sidelines uh, but important not to be involved in that war so and if you take kosovo 1999 if you take iraq 2003 what happened what happened they they stopped negotiations they would mean nato intervened in the case of kosovo and uh, this was not a long-term uh, solution, as we see now. So negotiations would be better. In the case of Iraq, weapons inspections by Hans Blix and by uh, Mohamed El Baradei would have been better than to to intervene militarily. So in 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 the in the long uh, view, you see, to keep neutrals out was not the best solution concerning Kosovo and concerning Iraq. And my last point, you mentioned the, the actual situation, uh, the, the confrontation, the conflict, we'd say the war uh, between Palestines and Israel. Uh, um, I think with regard to terrorism, we should not forget that um, neutrals uh, can serve as a kind of protection shield also against terrorism. There's a kind of respect uh, by the new, by the terrorists towards the, the issue of neutrality. So this would keep Switzerland and Austria also a bit more safer than Germany or countries. They are so much, let's say, one-sided positioned in that, in that conflict. And if you ask me for a kind of hope for a future solution, concerning a two-state um, uh, solution for both sides, we need also neutrals to, to negotiate and to mediate. The US are not in that position, and also Germany not, also due to the historical responsibility that uh, Germany has. So we need mediators, uh, not only for being protected against terrorism, we need mediators, and that's why I would underline the position pointed out by Heinz, that uh, neutrals are necessary. Heinz, the last two minutes go to you because there are people who would rather see uh, Austria join NATO. You know, one more member is better, a 33rd member rather than a neutral Austria. Do you, do you understand what the, what the logic behind that is? And do you see the value in Austrian neutrality still today? 
No, uh, Aust if Austria gave up its neutrality, it would uh, immediately join NATO like Finland and Sweden and lose all this uh, uh, um, potentials of neutral states as mediators, uh, providing good services, uh, engage neutrality, that will all be uh, all be gone. But Austria being neutral still missed many opportunities. And also uh, after uh, uh, in 2014, when the model of Austria for Ukraine was on the table, uh, the Austrian foreign ministry picked it up for a couple of uh, months and dropped it in October uh, 2014 for uh, several reasons, which I don't want to talk about. Uh, second point, you don't need necessarily too much uh, uh, hard power. Of course, neutrals have to be armed. That's important to have a credible neutrality has to be credible politically, but also militarily. Militarily, armed neutrality is possible. But you don't need uh, a too strong military in order to play a political role. We see this. Uh, Qatar is a, a small military power, but uh, is playing a huge uh, intermedi uh, um, mediation role as interlocutor. Uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, even the Ukraine war, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, now Hamas and, and, and US. And so you don't need necessarily hard power. And last point, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the war now going on in, in, the, in, in the Middle East. Austria has a strong tr tradition in good suggestions and Austria was a small neutral state and with Bruno Kreisky, Austria could make good, good proposals and Austria was the first uh, uh, states, statesman to bring the idea of the two state solutions before the United Nations. So that was an, basically an Austrian uh, idea. But Austria dropped it and now I guess, uh, to some extent, these tensions could have been avoided if Austria had followed up with this tradition. And we have these Abraham Accords between Israel and the Arab states, and Saudi Arabia was about uh, to join, sidelining the Palestinians, entirely sidelining the Palestinians, leading this for any time future, some, some solution. Austria could have said, we follow up the Kreisky tradition and say, first the Palestinian situation uh, resolved, going back to the 67 borders, and then the Abraham Accords between uh, Israel and the Arab states. So that would have turned the, uh, uh, the situation around and not sidelined the Palestinians. That's the problem we have here now because of the war. So Austria missed many opportunities. So that's what I'm saying, but in the future it could seize opportunities coming up. Let me let me just uh, very briefly add uh, one point concerning uh, CSCE from a historical point of view. Uh, the non-aligned and neutral states were not only supporting um, the process of the CSCE, also they helped to prevent the breakdown of the CSCE follow-up conference, conferences mm -hmm. in 1983 when we had these uh, meetings in Madrid due to the so-called Second Cold War. And if you look to new research outcomes concerning uh, the third CSCE follow-up conference in Vienna, taking place from 1986 to 1989, you can uh, see with uh, historical archival evidence that especially the neutrals with non-papers bridged the gap uh, between the hardliners of the Eastern camp, so Romania and especially the GDR, and they in the end could uh, um, achieve solving the, the, the tensions between the GDR delegation and the West German delegation in Vienna in order to get uh, visa-free solutions, uh, to get uh, the more improved and strengthened the hu human dimension of the CSCE process. As you, we can show that uh, the Austrians, the Swiss, the Swedes helped to, to bridge the gap between the different positions between GDR and FRG uh, delegations in Vienna and contributed to, in the end, to the solution of the German question. Um, and this was, as we well know, the key problem of the Cold War, the division of Germany, the German-German Cold War was part of the European and the world Cold War. And I think this historical evidence should be, let's say, a motivation, a stimulation that with a more engaged and active mediation policy and neutrality policy, Switzerland and Austria can contribute for a better solution in 
future Europe. I couldn't say it better. And with these words, happy Neutrality Day, my Austrian friends, and we'll talk again next time. Okay, yes. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you.